नमस्कार आप देख रहे हैं राजपथ ब्लूमबर्ग क्विंट हिंदी क्विंट और इंग्लिश क्विंट पर हमारे इंटरव्यू का खास कार्यक्रम और आज हमारे मेहमान हैं पूर्व वित्त मंत्री श्री पी चिदम्बरम साहब चिदम्बरम साहब आपने बजट को बहुत अच्छे से देखा उसके बाद बहुत सारे इंटरव्यू दिए मेरा ये कहना है कि बहुत ही ऑनेस्ट डॉक्यूमेंट है बजट कम है इलेक्शन स्टेटमेंट ज़्यादा है सो वाई आर यू वी क्वरलिंग विथ दी नंबर्स एंड द डॉक्यूमेंट सो मच बिकॉज द नंबर्स डोंट एड अप Why should I accept numbers that don't add up? They have made grand announcements in the budget speech, but then when I go to the expenditure budget, I go to the outlay statement, I go to the expenditure on the major scheme statement. I don't find the money. So if the money is not there, I'm entitled to ask, how are you going to raise this money? And where are you going to raise this money from? Secondly, I've pointed out, and at least half a dozen critical schemes, they have reduced the allocation for 2018-19 as compared to the revised estimate of 2017-18. Yet they say that these programs will be expanded, these programs will be improved. How will these programs be improved or expanded if you have not provided? Even the same amount that you provided in 2017-18, even nominal inflation will require that you have to provide more money. So I think uh, the numbers don't add up, and therefore we are seriously questioning the intention of this government. Okay, uh, you also spoke about uh, this health protection scheme. Now they have come up with some numbers. Are they not convincing enough to you? They have not come up with any numbers. One officer says it will cost eight thousand to ten thousand crore. Another officer says it will cost twelve thousand crore. Another officer says, insurance company officer says it will cost twenty thousand crore. No secretary to government is willing to put a figure on that. The minister is not willing to put a figure on that. We know that there are half a dozen states in this country, which are running similar programs, where the insurance cover is for one lakh of rupees. And if you add up the premium that is being contributed by all these states, they are now paying a premium of one lakh crore. So to cover up to one lakh, population in about half a dozen states, the premium is one lakh crore. You are now. Saying that you're going to cover 50 crore people for five lakhs each, even at a premium of one percent, no insurance company will give you an insurance policy for five lakh crore at a premium of one percent. Premium of one percent means fifty thousand crore. Premium of two percent means one lakh crore. Premium of three percent means one and a half lakh crore. I'm taking the middle number. One lakh crore is the premium. Where is the provision? So when you referred uh, this number, your friend Mr. Arun Jaitley, he tried to teach you how insurance works. He said, please ask him to understand whether we will take trust route or insurance route. Most likely insurance route that we will decide. But it's not about one lakh crore. B between five to ten thousand crore rupees, we can launch the scheme for this year at least. How can you launch a scheme if you want to cover all fifty crore people? Once you say I'm going to cover 50 crore people, how can you pick and choose? How do you know A will fall ill and B will not fall ill? You have to cover all 50 crore, or will you go state by state? You will cover only the BJP states first. And the states are free to not choose their schemes. That is another jumla. Initially, the announcement did not say anything about states sharing the burden. Suddenly, they come out and say 40% will be given by the state. Which state has been consulted? Sir, how can a government be so non-serious that without any homework they will launch world's biggest insurance scheme? This is the world's biggest unfunded jumla. Which state has been consulted? Which state has agreed to come on board? Which state has agreed to contribute forty percent? Andhra is running a scheme. Tamil Nadu is running a scheme. Why should they give up their scheme and join your scheme? So just before election, it is an election year. Just before that, uh, the government's credibility is at the stake. They will have to do something. They must have done some homework. No, they have not. 
Ask them to produce the paper they've got. Before an announcement of this kind is made, I agree, there may not be a cabinet note. There should be at least some basic paper. Ask them to publish the paper and invite a public debate. Remember how Obamacare was launched? Huge amount of research. A document is produced, placed in the public domain. It is debated, and then it is launched. Besides, we are seriously questioning an insurance-based healthcare program. This is the American model. The British model, the European model, is not based on insurance. It's based on expanding public hospitals and public health facilities, which are free to the people. For the same money, you should actually be building more public hospitals, district level, taluk level, block level, hire more doctors, buy more equipment, hire more nurses, install more beds, so that people can get access to medical care free. You really think that they will put their credibility at stake in such a manner where this will boomerang? They must have thought something they will be able to roll out. And the good thing about insurance is that you make feel good uh, to, say, 50 crore people, but actually you will be distributing it to 5 lakhs people. But you have to cover 50 crore people. Please understand, you can't pick and choose who will fall ill. You will have to cover 50 crore people. And make provision for that. And for that, you have to pay a premium. Insurance-based health care benefits the insurance company, not the people. Anyway, their track record is they don't look before they leap. They leap and then look back. Uh -oh. They've done that in the past, demonetization. They didn't calibrate the ATM machines. They did not know that the new 2,000 rupee note would not fit into the machine. They did not have enough currency in their vaults. That is now, the track record Now of for government. 200 rupees not also it is being recalibrated course, once the, again. The left hand of this government does not know what the right hand is doing because neither the left hand nor the right hand has anything to do. It's all decided in one place by one person and the left hand is told do this and the right hand is told do that. Sir, you have also amplified this whole uh, new discussion on Pakora economy. So Mr. Amit Shah, in his debut speech today, has referred your statement and he has countered your argument that it is uh, doing any job with dignity is a job creation. I said so. Why don't you consider I this as so. a job creation? I said so. I said selling pakoras is honorable self-employment. It is not a job. We are talking about jobs. Go to the ILO definition of a job. A job means a certain degree of certainty, regularity in payment, and security. That's a job. I'm a lawyer. I don't hold a job. I'm self-employed. There are other lawyers who are employed in some big company as a legal assistant or a legal officer. He's got a job. We are now talking about jobs. What you said was, we will create two crore jobs a year. I have not decried pakora selling, but even the young men who sell pakoras, what did they say? Do they want to sell pakoras? They went and protested against Prime Minister Modi's rally in Karnataka yesterday, wearing their graduate gowns. A graduate does not want to sell pakora. He's doing that because he has nothing else to do, nothing better to do. He has to earn a living. But don't count that as a job. So this government hopes, based on rural infrastructure spending uh, schemes like irrigation and mudra, they will be able to create some good number of jobs they can't. in this election year. They can't. I'll tell you why. Their own numbers, and the finance minister's budget speech confirms it, the average mudra loan is 43,000 rupees. I will give you 43,000 rupees today. Please start a business and create a job. How can you create a job with 43,000 rupee investment? 43,000 rupees can help you buy, I mean, a, a cobbler or shoe repairer, can buy some needle, some string, some leather. A hairdresser can buy some knives, some shaving machine, shaving cream. Um, a carpenter can buy some tools. How does 43,000 rupees create a job? If 43,000 rupees can create a job, 
we can create more jobs and there are job seekers in this country. Yeah, so the government says we are not creating job seekers, we are creating job givers. At least he's employing himself. Rupees you can give a job. He's employing himself at least. That is not a job. And that's what I'm trying to say. That is not a job. Most people are engaged, to use your word, employed in low-level, low-skill jobs because they have to earn a living. They have to live somehow. Why does a graduate apply for a peon's job? Why does a PhD, MSc, MBA apply for a peon's job? Does he want a peon's job? No. He has to make a living. He's desperate. Don't count that as a job. Uh, on long-term capital gains tax, you had removed it. Now, in certain I conditions... I think it was removed the year before. Anyway, oh, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. UPA FTCG removed. was removed, yes. Yeah. And then now NDA has reintroduced uh, that tax. What is wrong with it? One asset class, which is not taxed so far, should be taxed. I'm not against taxing every asset class. If some asset classes have been exempted, they have been exempted for a reason. Why was long-term capital gains removed? an STT introduced. Long-term capital gains was removed because you wanted to encourage retail participation in the equity market. That culture is not there in India. And it started in the urban metropolitan centers. But we want this culture to go to the two-tier, three-tier towns, rural areas. People must save in risk capital. In order to encourage that, we introduced LTCG. I mean, we abolished LTCG. Now, the LTCG has to be reintroduced. As a principle, I have no objection. Question is, is this the right time to do it? Is this the time to do it when interest rates are high, when investments are not taking place, when credit is not growing, when Indian industry is very shy of investment, when excess capacity is there? Is this the time to tax the equity investor who's willing to put his money in risk capital. I think the issue is debatable. Uh, you think the foreign investors will be now discouraged and they may actually uh, pull out? To some well, extent? I'm not saying they'll pull out. They will go to other jurisdictions. They will move to Singapore. They'll move to Dubai. See, there are two major bosses to our left and right. Don't think that Mumbai is the biggest boss in this region. There's one in Singapore, there's one in Dubai, there's one in Hong Kong, a well-established boss. There's one in Shanghai. And they have quickly created some new derivative of products. Of course, that is what they will do. Once you do something, it's not as though everyone else will keep quiet. Everyone will immediately create a derivative product. Therefore, you have to weigh the pros and cons and then decide, is this the right time to introduce LTCG? So how should we interpret the current fall uh, in the stock market? Because Mr. Jetley says that this is a combination of factors, not because of budget. Maybe global factors are playing. Well, you can always blame multiple factors. But as long as LTCG is one of the factors, well, I mean, that is a drawback. And this will also uh, increase the tendency of becoming behaving like a trader rather than investor. No, a lot of people will move to other asset classes. They'll move to gold now. They'll move to gold, they'll move to real estate. Therefore, you, you can't tell millions of people which asset class you should invest in. Uh, I suspect that a lot of money will move to gold. Which is not a good idea for this Which is completely of... unproductive. Absolutely. Investment in the equity market, that money is available for industrial investment or business investment. Investment in gold, uh, it's locked up investment. It becomes a dead investment. Uh, sir, we have spoken a lot about uh, fiscal deficit numbers. The revenue deficit numbers are not uh, being discussed in that greater detail. Experts generally keep saying that that is also a dangerous trend. And sometimes we are not able to figure out what kind of deficit quality you have and what money you are borrowing and going in what kind of expenses. Uh, would you like to articulate your thoughts on that? The Fiscal deficit limit has been breached. The revenue deficit limit has also been breached. They are borrowing this year, three point, this year means 2017-18, 3.5%. They should have borrowed 3.2. That 0 0.3 is an additional 54,000 crore. You must add the 37,000 crore, which ONGC borrowed, 
and gave it to the government. That is a device. So 91,000 crore is the additional borrowing. I'm not even counting the 80,000 crore for recapitalization. Keep that aside. I want to know where this 91,000 crore went. If this 91,000 crore had gone into investment, maybe I will say, all right, you're borrowing for investment. This entire 91,000 crore has gone into the revenue deficit. And you how, spent your money. And how bad is that? It's quite bad. I think the revenue deficit is about 2.6 or so, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's bad. Your 91,000 crore of additional borrowing is going into the revenue deficit. And non-tax revenue government doesn't uh, seem to uh, be convinced uh, for bold and clear measures. It is pocket to pocket transfer. Well, 37,000 crore is an ONGC gift to the government. Hmm. The RBI shut the door and said, sorry, we can't give you any more because demonetization has cost us a huge amount of our, our profit. Now, their uh, dividend income from PSUs has come down. They've got disinvestment. Other receipts, they seem to have got more. But that, again, is inflated by 37,000 crore. They have not collected one lakh crore. They've really collected only 63,000 crore. Therefore, they've run out of ideas. They've run out of gas. They're stepping into the fifth year. They've run out of gas. This car will break down sometime this year, or it will come to a stop at the end of the year. And for that, we must thank God. The breakdown will be reflected in the kind of numbers that, according to them, Harvard-educated people keep discussing. As far as their voter outreach is concerned, don't you think that narrative is fine, doing OK, and is being amplified? The last, the last mark sheet came out of Rajasthan. The one before that came out of Gujarat. I can't go by an examination you wrote two years ago or three years ago. I'm testing your current ability, your current learning ability. The last mark sheet was in Gujarat. In Gujarat, you aimed at 150. You had about 130-odd seats. You came, down to eight, you came down to 99 seats. 99, according to me, is a defeat for the BJP. It is the state of the prime minister, the state of the party president. They poured in enormous resources. The entire cabinet was camping there. The prime minister himself addressed some 40 rallies. 99 seats means that you barely pass the exam. 40 marks out of 100. The next examination was in Rajasthan. You had a 2 lakh 60,000 margin, which has now become minus 1 lakh 97,000. You had another margin of 84,000. It's come down to minus 1 lakh 26,000. You had another margin of about 12,000, it has become some minus 12,000. What does it indicate? It indicates that nobody is willing to buy your story. Urban India, Alwar, Ajmer are towns. They did not buy your story. Rural Rajasthan did not buy your story. The three constituencies are one in the west, one in the center, one in the east. East Rajasthan didn't buy your story. Central Rajasthan didn't buy your story. West Rajasthan didn't buy your story. Youth did not buy your story. Your trading community did not buy your story. So who's buying your narrative? There will be other tests. I'm not saying what the result will be. There will be other class tests, monthly tests, midterm tests. Uh, there will be other tests. One is coming, with up. Karnataka, One is coming up now in Madhya Pradesh. There are two assembly seats coming up in Jyoti Raditya's India's constituency. Let us see what happens there. And followed by UP. Then there's Karnataka. What happened in Bengal? A margin of 2 lakhs has become a margin of 6 lakhs for the Trinamool. Therefore, by but, any but BJP measure, has been able to replace CPM as party number 2. That's, that's neither here nor there. There's no silver medals in elections. There's only one medal, gold medal. There's no silver medal. Sir, from that argument, in Gujarat, they got simple majority and plus. So it is about getting back pass to mark. power. Pass marks. Pass marks. Yes. In first past the post scheme, the kind of huge mega electoral machine that Mr. Modi 
runs. Even if there are more people who are not impressed by Mr. Modi or BJP, getting them to vote is a big challenge. No, but they and tried Mr. Modi it, is par excellence. They tried it in Rajasthan, it didn't succeed. Are you saying that their missionary in Rajasthan is any less than the missionary in Gujarat? They didn't succeed. I agree, Congress parties, party must become a fitting, more fit, more fighting machine. We almost did it in Gujarat. Remember, in Gujarat, might be interested to know, in 12 polling booths, if we had got the same vote that we got in 2014, we would have got five more seats. If we had aligned with the NCP, NCP would have got one more seat, we would have got one more seat. So our 80 would have become 87, their 99 would have become 92. So precisely my point. Therefore, party will have to get stronger. You can't always uh, depend upon the weakness of the opponent. Congress lost 16 seats by the margin of 1 to 3,000 votes yes. in Gujarat. Yes. That last mile connectivity, those 3,000 voters more to come to booth to vote for your party, is the challenge and Mr. Modi is uh, super efficient. No, but we can be as efficient as he is in other states. In Gujarat, we almost made it. But I think in Karnataka, our organization is just as strong. And I think uh, by the time the Rajasthan election comes, in Rajasthan also, we are paying attention to it, and the party units will become strong. So one big constituency that is really very worrisome for BJP is farmers. And the kind of stuff with MSP uh, this budget is trying to do, do you think it will work? What have they said? They have said in the fifth year, please remember, for four years, they were sleeping like Kumbhakarna. Fifth year, they wake up and said, we're going to give you cost plus 50. The rabi is over. The tariff is coming in September, October. So whatever cost plus 50% you give will only be effective for the tariff crop, which is in October this year. Nothing between now and October for the farmer. And then you say cost plus 50. Dr. Swaminathan, Dr. Ashok Gulati, many other experts have asked, which cost? There is C1 plus family labor. There is C2, which cost? You don't tell us which cost you're going to take into account. And then you say, we have already given cost plus 50 for some crops. So which crops have you given? So all this is bluffing. Come out with a concrete paper telling us which cost, which crops, when you will give, how you will calculate. Give us a complete cost data. I mean, there is something known as cost accountancies in this country. You hire a cost accountant and tell us how the costs are worked out, and then we'll tell you. If you have already given C, uh, cost plus 50 for some crops, why, why is there so much farmer distress? Uh, but this will also, now people are talking about, <clears throat> it will increase the inflation, CPI. So what will happen, if we want to sum up this conversation, to inflation and to interest rate, and then again investment and then growth? See, the fiscal deficit rise itself will increase inflation. In order to make exports competitive, the economic survey says that the rupee is overvalued. So if you allow the rupee to slide downward, that will also increase inflation because imported goods will become costlier. If you give MSP, it has a mild inflationary effect. But then there is no trade-off between MSP and inflation. MSP is for the welfare of the farmers. So that is mildly inflationary. So all put together, I don't think inflation is going to come down. In December, CPI inflation was 5.1%. Let's see what the number comes in January and number comes in February. And then the RBI will meet and RBI will give us its report. I can't see inflation coming down. And so is interest rate, no chance of... Interest rates will go up, actually. Interest rates, when the bond prices have already... Bond yields have already gone up. When bond yields go up, that is an indication that interest rates will move up. So, politically speaking, uh, I think this government has this comfort level or confidence that Indian economy is doing fine. Is now, we, we are not giving any big new shock. It will go on on its own 
uh, uh, intensity or velocity and let's focus on election. But people are not accepting that story. People are seeing through the BJP. People are no longer accepting the story that you have the capacity to manage India's economy. So, People are questioning the capacity of the BJP to manage the economy. So maybe they are somewhat disappointed. If they are only disappointed, Mr. Modi and BJP are still safe. I don't agree. I don't agree. After the 20% swing in Rajasthan and the huge swing in uh, Bengal, and you watch now, Odisha is coming, Madhya Pradesh is coming. I don't think it is a disappointment. I think it has moved to a point where we can call it disenchantment. But not anger. Because if I don't see an alternative, if I'm just disappointed with you, I will grudgingly still vote for you. I don't agree. The vote will go to the next strongest party in the state. I'm not saying it will go to the Congress. In Tamil Nadu, it won't go to the Congress. It will go to one of the Dravidian parties. In Kerala, it may not go to the Congress. It may go to the other party. In Bengal, it will go to Trinamool. So if you are disenchanted with a political party, like in Gujarat, that vote went to Congress. If you're disenchanted in Rajasthan, it will go to Congress. But if you're disenchanted in Orissa, it may go to Biju Janata Dal. Sir, then three states I want to, I'm very curious to know from you. In Tamil Nadu, will Congress and DMK, or the other Dravid party, will have a pre-poll alliance? At the moment, the DMK and Congress are on the same page. We are together in meetings, we are the, together in demonstrations, we are together in protests, and we have acknowledged that the DMK will be the leader of any pre-poll alliance. Whether there will be a change, I can't say, but at the moment, it appears that there will be a pre-poll alliance with the DMK as a leader and the Congress as a member. Sir, everything hinges on only one alliance, which Congress must facilitate, which is between Akhilesh and Mayavati. Well, I don't know much about UP politics to make a prediction. If there can be a Mahagad Bandhan, they say, between SP and BSP, and Congress is able to bring that together, like we did in Bihar, between Lalu Yadav ji and Nitish Kumar ji, it may be good for the opposition. But I'm not fully aware of the dynamics of UP politics, so I can't comment on that. But at the national level, coordinating all the parties on national issues to face a parliamentary election, that responsibility falls on the Congress. Totally. So should we consider Congress and NCP alliance also a done deal, or it is not certain? Well, the last time I spoke to Mr. Sharad Pawar, uh, that was about six or seven days ago, he said that, uh, yes, NCP and Congress will be together. I told him he should make it public. Uh, he said, I have made it public, but I said there may be one or two voices in your party which take a different view, and those voices should be asked to remain still. I think if I, I accept Mr. Sharad Pawar's statement, he clearly wants to be with the Congress. And I think uh, Mr. Ashok Chavan, our PCC president, who participated in that Save Democracy March, has also made it clear that we will be with the NCP. That means Congress has to convince itself that it has to trust Mr. Pawar. Well, Pawar is an old congressman. We may have had differences in between. He may have uh, done some things which didn't make us happy. We may have done some things which didn't make him happy. But basically, he's a congressman. But uh, when we talk about alliances and regional parties, there is a thing called CBI. You know what I mean, that ruling party would like to use CBI so, to stall certain uh, alliances. I don't know. I don't think uh, CBI is so clever as to stall alliances. <laughs> Not CBI, the political masters. <laughs> you see, in 2003, they said Mr. Vajpayee was unbeatable. Mr. Vajpayee was indeed a tall leader. He was a great orator. He had great resonance with the people. And everybody trusted Mr. Vajpayee as a good man who had no personal agenda, who was interested in the welfare of the country. 
But a kind of informal alliance did come up and the Congress became the number one party and we were able to form the government. So don't uh, come to any conclusions about an election before elections take place. Elections are, can throw up miracles in this country. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank it you. is always a pleasure to talk to Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.